And who in the room, last question for now, feel that you understand how to predict your own personal long-term happiness? Okay. Slightly above average. I guess, given the room, it's not surprising. But what's interesting is that I, tell, I ask this question everywhere I go now. And I, I travel globally talking about delivering happiness, and it never fails every single time I ask this question. There's only like 1% to 5% of the room that raises their hand up. And that to me is so remarkable because here we are, you know, we're relatively advanced. All of our ancestors like, sacrificed so much for us to get to where we are today. But yet here we are as a global society, generally unhappy in figuring out what will create happiness for us long term in life. So why is that? I mean, we think about it. It's not new. I mean, for Americans, it's in our um, Declaration of Independence. Uh, there's a guy by the name of Aristotle, 200, 300 BC, who started talking about happiness then, saying, happiness is our purpose. It's our aim of our existence. More interesting than what he said is happiness dependent on ourselves. So what's the problem here? What is going on? But seriously, though, taking it back to this room, everyone in here asking the simple question, what are your own personal goals in your life? And if you ask that question, what's interesting is that no matter who you ask in this room or outside of it, build a successful business, have an you know, amazing family, get healthier, whatever it is, you ask yourself why enough times, it comes back to the same thing. I want to be happy. I want to make the people around me that I care about happy. So why is it so elusive? And I just want to caveat when I say happiness. It's about the science of happiness. So there's actual hardcore data and research being done as to what can increase our levels of happiness in everyday life. And so why in the world are we so bad at predicting it as humans? We all know about lottery winners and we expect them to be happier from then on, but we also know this, uh, the studies show that their happiness levels either stay the same or actually go down. What's also interesting is that inverse is true. When we talk about people and we see people that maybe lose their sight or lose their use of their limbs, their happiness levels actually stay the same or actually increase. So this is all going to say, going to show that we are really bad at predicting it. Why is this the case? So I started reflecting it uh, for my own life because I find it so ironic to be standing in front of you today talking about happiness because I was not the happy-go-lucky kid growing up. I was the one in high school with my Walkman on, listening to The Cure, reading books like L'Etranger, The Stranger uh, by Albert Camus in French. I mean, you can't get more glum than that, right? <laughs> and thinking about all these questions, like, why are we here? What is this all for? And so that's why I started reflecting, like, how did I get here? And so I started thinking about um, graduating and, and going to college. If you guys read the book Delivering Happiness, Tony talks about Asian American parents. I have them as well. So in that household, for whatever reason, I thought there were three quintessential things to be successful in life. Number one was get into a good school. Number two was become a doctor or a lawyer. And number three was learn a variety of musical instruments. <laughs> so for me, I thought I had it made. You know, I was at, I got into Cal, uh, Berkeley, and I was studying pre-med. And I had several years of piano under my belt. So I was like, yay, I'm a success in my parents' eyes at least. And so I started studying, and I realized, you know, this actually isn't for me. And so I started wandering. And I stumbled upon something called Asian American Studies. And I was just so impassioned by it, because I all of a sudden learned all these things I never knew about myself or my ancestors. So I was so excited. I picked up the phone, called my parents, and told them I was going to major in it. And you guys can totally picture the scene that happened next, right? They completely freaked out. They said, are you serious? We're working all these jobs for you and your brother. We're sacrificing all these things so that you guys can have opportunities that we did not have growing up. Your great, 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 great grandparents sailed the Pacific Ocean in a boat and almost died so that you can study yourself. And I was like, wow, they're really good at this guilt thing. <laughs> but I stood my ground. I said, no, I'm going to do it. And I majored in it, I graduated, and I remember that moment, I knew exactly what they were talking about. I couldn't get a job. So it was my turn to freak out, and I started cold calling every single company I knew, and it was totally about timing. That's when the whole internet phenomena, phenomenon in the, next, in the late 90s was born, and I became an internet consultant at KPMG. And all of a sudden, literally overnight, money title status like, fell in my lap, and I was like, dang, this is easy, I proved my parents wrong. And as everyone in this room knows as well, the ending of that story, the dot-com collapsed, and I got laid off. 
And I felt like such a loser. It wasn't the fact that necessarily that I lost my job that I felt like a loser, but it was because the things that I, meant, that, that I thought meant everything, the money title status, meant nothing at all. And so that's when I started wandering, and I realized I was running away from this question, which was, what would I do for the rest of my life without the fear of failure? And so for me, that's when, if you read the book, that's when Tony and I climbed Mount Kilimanjaro. I didn't know what to do with my life. I just wanted to get away from it, but I didn't know what I wanted to come back to. And so here we are, climbing Mount Kilimanjaro. I just got laid off from my job. Tony just sold his company, Link Exchange, for about $180 million to uh, Microsoft. Clearly, here we are climbing this mountain at the opposite ends of the financial spectrum, right? But what was really interesting, we didn't realize it until we started working on this book together, was that we were asking ourselves the same exact question, which was, what are we going to do that we're be so passionate about where money doesn't matter? So we summited. It was something like straight out of the movie, and it was amazing. It felt like anything is possible. I came back. I looked like world, at the world in that way. But then something happened. It's that 180 that I know everyone in this room experiences at least once in your life, if not many, many times. And for me, it was facing my greatest fear. And it's for me, it was losing someone in my life that I couldn't imagine life without. And that was my father. I lost him to colon cancer. And again, those were kind of the moments that brought me to this forefront of what am I really going to do on a day-to-day -day basis that's of meaning and substance, knowing that something can be taken away from me just like that. So that's when I really started looking life as a green field and just started doing things that I was super passionate about again. I started writing, I started doing uh, graphic design, I started making films, just stuff that I thought was of meaning and of true to who I was. And through that process, inadvertently, I realized I was developing my own personal core values, which was if it's not the money title status, what is it? And for me, it was the people in my life. And I knew the decisions I would be basing it on would be on that from then on. So at that point, it was really strange that I stumbled upon this thing called Zappos. Because when I met it, it was just this tiny little startup. And all I wanted to do was sell the most shoes in the world. And then I grew up a little bit and said, you know what, actually, we're going to focus on customer service. And then grew up a little bit more and said, you know what, we're actually going to focus on employee happiness. And through that process, realized what they're doing, their purpose, and their values were all around delivering happiness to the world. So in a weird way, we had this parallel of here I was developing my own values, and Zappos was doing it as well. And then fast forward a few years later, here comes delivering happiness. And the reason why I put it in this weird array of this particular slide you might be asking is because looking back, I mapped it on two axes, time and happiness, and realized on these highs and lows of my life, what were the values that were present and what were the values that were missing? And thinking through those kind of experiences, how do I increase steadily purpose and meaning and therefore happiness in my life. And I invite you guys to do this exercise. It's actually pretty interesting. Um, so now I'll go back to, of course, like where my background has come from, uh, Zappos and how it all started. And so this is actually a picture of Zappos. There's not a rainbow over it every day, if you could believe it. But I put this picture up here to talk about this quote from Maya Angelou. People will forget what you said. They'll forget what you did. But they'll never forget how you made them feel. And I put it up there not because I just like it as a personal mantra, but it's actually a mantra that Zappos lives by, a company that lives by this, knowing this is the way they guide their decisions on a day-to-day -day basis. And what's interesting is that when people think about Zappos, they first think, oh, yeah, great customer service. That's what they're all about. But that's not their priority at all internally. Their priority is actually company culture, number one. And the whole thought about that is that if you get your company culture right, everything else, like great customer service, higher productivity, higher profitability, actually comes more naturally. And this was just kind of a hypothesis that Zappos had as it was growing up over the years. It began in 1999. What's interesting is that we were not the only ones showing it. In parallel, there were like, um, researchers like Jim Collins, who wrote Good to Great, uh, Tribal Leadership was a book that came out a few years ago, that realized that, you know what, Let's look at long-term sustainable brands. What makes them different? And it wasn't the typical things that you would think, you know, productivity, efficiency, things like that. It was actually two things. It was having a strong company culture and having a higher purpose for their employees to be inspired by. 
So I talk about Zappos because it's just kind of a, you know, an example of one of the examples out there of a company that focused on customer service and company culture that eventually became a $2 billion um, company in gross merchandise sales and, as many of you know, was sold to Amazon for $1.2 billion at the time of closing a few years ago now. But I talk about Zappos not because that's the only one that's out there. What's great is that there are other companies doing this as well. Looking at this graph of the best workplaces to, uh, in the US, in the last 10 years, they've systematically uh, outperformed those in the S&P 500 by focusing on employee well-being. So this is all great news in saying it's not just Zappos, it's actually other companies that realize the potential of focusing on happiness of employees to create sustainable businesses. So so what did we learn along the way? Because as I said, again, Zappos was the sort of petri dish of like how do we grow a company? How do you scale something like that when you're focusing on happiness? So the lessons we learned, number one was commitment. Because we all know that company culture is not you know, free Red Bull in the fridge and a foosball table in the rec room. It's something more than that. It's something almost like an organism that grows and changes as people come in your our company and as they leave. So is there a commitment to that? Many of you have heard the story of the customer service call that took 10 and a half hours with one single customer for Zappos this past uh, holiday season, 2012. And it resulted in a sale of a, sh a pair of shoes for $49.99. So we all know that's not great for the bottom line. But does Zappos care? No, because they're so committed to this aspect of customer service number one, company culture number one. Number two, what we learned is core values. So co company core values, it sounds like you know, something very corporate-y. In fact, when we first started Zappos, it, it, sound, it was almost uh, uncomfortable to be establishing, establishing core values. Because there's so many times you see core values on a plaque on a wall, in the lunchroom, or the boardroom, but their employees don't even know their values, let alone the senior management executives. But at Zappos, every single person knows their 10 core values. And they actually have to, uh, there's a $4,000 standing offer at, after the end of training for them to quit. So they pay them to quit unless they really want to instill these core values in their life. So number one I would uh, ask you on this core values aspect is, what are your core values? Do you have them in your company? Do you live by them? And another great question to ask is, what are your personal core values? And whether or not your personal and company core values align. Because that's a really easy question to say, if they don't, why don't they? And what needs to be done about that? Number three is transparency. And that's just being true to yourself and being honest. Open and honest with, with Zappos on a company level, whether they had good news or bad news, they were always transparent about it. When they had to go through a series of layoffs, when they had about 20 million names stolen from their database, number one was like, how do we become the most transparent company we can so whether you're a customer, employee, media, they all know the truth and so therefore they can you know, use the information um, to benefit instead of hiding everything so everyone has an uneasy feeling of what they're doing. So that's on the company side. Transparency on a personal side, what Zappos and Delivering Happiness really believes in is being true to your weird self. One of the interview questions like, is on a scale of one to 10, how weird are you? For everyone that's smirking right now, I know exactly where your weirdness scale is. It's funny for people uh, to react to that question because the whole idea is like, can you be true to your weird self at work? Can you, be in, you know, bring your unique uh, behaviors and, and uh, passions into work? And on the other end, can you be receptive and embracing of those other people bringing their own weird things to work as well? So we talk about work-life integration, not like work-life balance, not even work-life, you know, work-life um, balance or uh, separation. It's all about how do you integrate it so that when you leave w home, you don't have to put your home hat where your doorknob is. You can actually wear it to work because you're one and the same person in bringing those passions inside and outside back to the workplace. Number four is vision, and this one is pretty simple in this whole aspect of how do you inspire your employees? What is the why of what you do? There's so many employees that, there's a Gallup poll in 2011, said that 71% of employees in US alone are disengaged from their work, resulting in $300 billion loss on an annual basis just in the US alone. So here's our question, then how do we flip that around so we get employees to be engaged with their work? and engage with their uh, fellow coworkers so that productivity levels actually go up. 
So the whole, whole idea is like, what is the why of what you do? For, for Zappos, it wasn't selling shoes anymore. It was something bigger than that. And people ask, like when they take tours of Zappos, they say, why are people smiling all the time? How do you get them to do that? And we say, well, two things. Number one, you hire the people that are smiling to begin with. And number two, everyone you talk to, whether it's answering phones, pickpacking and shipping, they truly believe they're delivering happiness. They have a higher purpose in the world. Number five is relationships. And when we talk about relationships, we talk about meaningful ones. Like, how do you create them and nurture them so that it's not just you know, a zero-sum game. It's actually you're doing a win-win-win for everyone involved. And we also talk about how making meaningful relationships within the workplace and with your partners, how that actually increases the efficiency and success of your business relationship. One of the ways that we encourage that is that, again, by being true to your weird self, there's probably someone in customer service, let's say, that's super passionate about kiteboarding or baking or hiking. And there's probably someone in the legal department or technology department that feels passionate about the same thing. So if you encourage people to bring their passions to work, they'll probably say, oh man, you love uh, kiteboarding too? Let's go this weekend. And they take that interaction outside and they actually have that meaningful experience and bring it back to the workplace the next day. So that's when we mean relationships. It's not just on the level of how do you create meaningful business relationships, but more personal, personal ones too that correspond to our own personal core values. And the last thing we learned was the right team. Like, how do you build the right team? Everyone knows how hard this is, right? And so what we learned at Zappos is like, number one is to hire slowly and fire quickly. And this sounds really harsh for a company that's all about people, but it just takes that one person, as you guys can know, within a department, within an organization, that can change the whole dynamic of how you're moving. We talk about, uh, if you imagine you know, birds over Serengeti, there was actually a book that just came out in an uh, article in Wired a couple months ago. It was super interesting. So basically, it was comparing um, patterns of animals in, in, the, in the wild. And so you have bees that are super chaotic in a hive. And then you'll see uh, a fish, uh, uh, a school of fish, let's say mackerel. And you, realize, and you see them when they go swimming round and round and round to defend themselves. And then you see a, a flock of birds over the Serengeti. And this is like the most unified one because they're all moving the same way, not one leader. Because once one bird changes, everyone, every other bird changes as well. What's interesting is that the algorithm, all these animals are all the same. The one difference that separates uh, from the bees to the fish to the most aligned uh, birds in the Serengeti is that one component, component of alignment. And if you, so basically, if you're saying, if you have the alignment, so every bird is this individual but they're all aligned by the same DNA, their same core values. You can actually operate as individuals, but together as an organism to be able to move and make changes and pivot as one. System. How do we make people happier instead of focusing on what makes us unhappy? So this is one of the frameworks we talk about, and it's in the book, last chapter. Number one, perceive control. So do you have a sense of control of your decisions? Basically, uh, at Zappos, what they do is that instead of saying, hey, you have to go through these certain modules and training to be able to get to the next level. Instead, they give you a menu option. So you have a menu of things that you want to say, well, actually, I want to learn more of this rather than that. So giving that sense of control it, it increases the level of happiness. And one of the things I talk about also is this whole notion of expectation management. When you have your ability to manage your expectations going in, that's your own level of control that only you as an individual is able to hold. The second thing we talk about is perceived progress. So perceived progress is a sense like, am I growing, am I developing, am I learning? One of the things that Zappos did in their merchandising team is instead of taking the whole 18 months to become from a, a lower uh, entry level person to a, a buyer, they said, well, let's take that 18 months and just chop it into th thirds. So every six months we'll say, hey, congratulations, this is what you've done, and this is how much farther I have to go. And just from that one one change alone, and nothing was changed in terms of cost or pay rate, that increased the levels of the, of the merchandising team because the feeling of they're actually getting somewhere. So just thinking about where your employees and how your company can think about ways to make people understand that, hey, there's a long way to go, but if we can do this bit by bit, we'll actually get there together in a more connected way. The third thing we talk about is connectedness, and this is simply the breadth and depth of your relationships at work or at home. And the last is vision and meaning, and I'll talk about this in a further slide. 
So this is another type of framework that we talk about in the book. It's the types of happiness we have. And number one is pleasure. And everyone, I'm sure, in this room, especially after the Tonga room last night, knows what pleasure is. <laughs> it's great, right? We want to party with our friends. We want to buy a new car. We want to get some new shoes. Whatever it is, that's awesome. It feels good. But unfortunately, going according to the science, it's very fleeting because you have to wake up the next morning and come to a conference like this in the morning. <laughs> so this is all great. We all need pleasure. But unfortunately, we cannot sustain it as human beings unless, of course, you're a rock star, which some of you might very well be. The second type of happiness we talk about is the sense of passion. And this is flow and engagement. Engagement is how you engage with your coworkers and people at home. Flow, this is actually a psychological term when you're doing something where hours go by, but it feels like minutes because you're so in the zone. Athletes feel it all the time. You guys heard about this college player, basketball, several months ago. He scored 130 something points in one game. And the media asked him, like, what were you thinking that whole time? And he's like, absolutely nothing. Because he didn't have to. He was so in his element between like this whole alignment of where his thought, where he didn't have to have some, his body, and just what he was programmed to do. And so for this, science says that like, if we increase our flow in our everyday life, whatever that might be, what are your passions? You know, going back to the kiteboarding, uh, hiking, biking, whatever examples, increase those in an everyday basis and your happiness levels will go up as well. If you know what your higher purpose and meaning is, and what we say is if you're true to your weird self, and through that, follow your passions. And through that, find your higher purpose and meaning. Whether it, I mean, everyone you know, can say, yeah, it's about having my kids, it's having my family. Yes, this is true. But what more is there that is really true to who you are, to your unique, your unique DNA that you can bring to the world? So what we've seen through this is that if we focus on that first, all the other stuff like the pleasure and passion, it's more like icing on the cake. Because this is the answer to us as human beings, sustaining happiness so that it just doesn't go away the next day. And so what became for us a aha moment at Zappos is that looking at the science of happiness is totally in parallel with what a business needs to be sustainably happy or productive or successful. We all know profits is very important and just a necessary thing in human life. Pleasure is important and necessary as well. But unless we layer passion and purpose on top of that, What's your purpose for your organization? What's your purpose as an individual? The chances of sustaining that happiness over time or sustaining a successful business over time are that much lower. So the, so the last story I'm going to tell. There are so many that we learned along the way, but this one is a uh, high school in Tucson in Arizona. And so basically, their teacher said, yeah, we would love delivering happiness to be required reading for our students. Um, can you send us some books? And we realized most of the students in the in this school don't even get a book per, per child. So we're like, of course, we sent all these books, and we're like, why don't we surprise them along our tour? So we stopped there, and actually they surprised us, and they had like this amazing mariachi band, they had the spread of food that they cooked for us, and it was just so unbelievable how much spirit this uh, stu school had, these students. And through that process, we realized most of them don't and will never leave 15, 20 mile radius from their home. Yet here they had so much energy. And so we're like, we were, we were floored and we left and a few months later, the teacher emails us again and says, you guys don't have a translation, Spanish translation for delivering happiness? We'll translate it for you. So we'll, we're gonna basically crowdsource our students and our teachers and we'll give it to you, no questions asked. We just wanna say thank you for inspiring us. So we took that translation, a few months later, fast forward, we get a call from a publisher in Spain. They said, hey, can we publish Delivering Happiness? And we said, well, we already have a version, only if you use this one, and only if you agree to a certain number of things. A few phone calls later, everything was fine. They said, let's do it. So now, basically, every single book in the world, Spanish translation, in every Spanish territory, everyone sold, a percentage of those proceeds are going to be going back to these kids in this school. Thank you. And I, I love telling that story just because they had no idea when putting something out there, something positive, what it would come back to them. But, so I'll leave this with just one last thought. Imagine a world, imagine a place that we are all true to our weird, unique selves. And that we are all are living by our true passions and purpose in our everyday lives. And imagine a world where we're all actually prioritizing happiness so that we can sustain it for ourselves, the people we love, 
and the companies that we build. And I ask that after imagining this for a little bit, they'd actually do something. Because we all know how easy it is to think about it, and we know how, how hard it is to actually make an action around it. Because it's my firm belief, given where we are at this time and place in the world, if we all do that, we can actually create change more than we ever thought possible in the world today. And who knew it'll all boil back down to something so simple, that's something called happiness. So I invite you guys all to do that, and I really want to thank you and appreciate everyone's time for being here. So thank you so much. <laughs>